I want to build things, Mr. Speaker. So often this Congress gets involved in doing things that my community is doing just fine back home, that my county is doing just fine back home, that my state is doing just fine back home. And for some reason, we think when the 435 of us gather together, uh, we're going to come up with a better idea about how to serve my community back home than my community back home has about how to serve that community. I think we get off uh, track there. I think we get into those unconstitutional uses of power or establishing post roads, one of those things our founding fathers asked the federal government to do because, quite simply, no one else can build an interstate highway system. It does no good for Georgia to have 12 lanes running to the Alabama border if Alabama doesn't have a road when we get there. This is a collaborative decision, and rightfully so. So how do we fund these highways, Mr. Speaker? We fund them primarily through what's called the Highway Trust Fund, and the Highway Trust Fund is funded through taxes on users of the highway system. I'm a huge fan of user fees. If you don't like to sit in traffic every morning, if you want to build an extra lane on your highway, as we are in Forsyth County, you should pay to build that extra lane on your highway. You shouldn't ask somebody in Wyoming to pay to build the road in Georgia. We should build the road in Georgia. Users of the roads should pay for the road. So that's what we do. What you can't see here, Mr. Speaker, is a graph of how the Highway Trust Fund is funded. Primarily, it's through a gas tax. It's 18.4 cents that comes out of every gallon of gas that Americans uh, buy. That gas tax is primarily the funding mechanism. But we also tax diesel. So all the truckers that are on the road, every time you're driving down that two-lane highway and you wish the guy in front of you was going a little bit faster, just know that he's paying a lot in taxes while he's on that road. He's helping to build uh, that road. Uh, diesel tax is higher than gasoline taxes, but because there are fewer diesel, diesel vehicles on the road, bring in less revenue. We also have a tax on all uh, trucks and trailers. We have a tax in this blue line on heavy vehicles. And we have a tax on tires. Again, all of these taxes come together not to tax for one, uh, one group of people to pay for another, but to tax users of our roads to pay for our roads. It's been a, a system that has served us uh, fairly well in this nation. But we haven't raised that gas tax uh, since the early 1990s. In the early 1990s, we set the gas tax at 18.4 cents a gallon. And we haven't raised it since. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm not in favor of raising uh, taxes. I'm in favor of paying less taxes. I'm in favor of, of taking on more of that responsibility back home. But again, in the case of post roads, we have to take on this responsibility. And the reason I'm having this special order tonight, Mr. Speaker, is because the Highway Trust Fund uh, expires in May. We have about two months uh, to sort out all of the challenges of how do we fund the interstate highway system going forward. And for folks who say, well, we've been funding it with 18.4 cent gas tax for, for 25 years, why isn't that good enough today? The answer is it may be. It may be good enough today, but understand that the buying power that we're getting out of that 18.4 cents has declined each and every year. Of course it has. The, the price of a Big Mac has gone up over the last 20 years. The price of a, a, a car has gone up over the past 20 years. The price of a home has gone up. The price of building roads has gone up. So the purchasing power that we're getting for our, for our gas tax has gone down and down and, and down and down. Uh, right now, we're, we're getting about 60% of the value out of that gas tax that we were getting when it was last changed in the early 1990s. Now, what's the impact of that? Uh, well, it's not just that the value of the purchasing power is going down. The, the mileage we're getting in our cars is going up. My first car, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what your first car was. Mine was a 1971 Volkswagen camper. I had 59 horsepowers in the back of that camper to drive me anywhere I wanted to go. If I coasted downhill and only used the accelerator a little bit uphill, I'd max out about 35 miles an hour. But I could get 14 miles a gallon if I tried. If I tried to drive that camper as efficiently as I could, I could get 14 miles to the gallon. 
Today, Mr. Speaker, I'm driving a Chevy Volt. Most of my drive battery. I'm not paying any gas taxes at all. When I do have to turn on the electric generator in that Chevy Volt, I'm getting 40 miles to the gallon. Just in my lifetime, the fuel efficiency is either triple based on an engine or no gas tax at all because I'm using electricity. This is what's happened. You go back to 1975, uh, Mr. Speaker, this is the average miles per gallon that passenger cars and light trucks uh, were getting. You get into the last uh, half of the last decade, you see that fuel efficiency is driving sharply forward, and the Obama administration wants to drive that fuel efficiency even higher. I'm in favor of using private industry to create more efficient solutions. I'm in favor of being able to reduce the, the fuel costs of families across this country. But what that's going to do as families are buying fewer and fewer gallons of gasoline is that the Highway Trust Fund is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Take a look at what's happened with the Highway Trust Fund, Mr. Speaker. The beginning back in... Uh, I'd say in the early 1990s, uh, when folks were buying lots of gasoline and, and uh, fuel costs were, uh, were relatively low, the economy was doing, was doing well, we were running a trust fund surplus. Again, all of this gas tax money is coming in from all of these sources. We were spending it on those priorities that we have in the interstate highway system. Some of those priorities were building new interstate highways. Some of those priorities were maintaining old interstate highway. Some of those priorities were simply widening part of the interstate highway system. But we operated with a bit of a surplus in the Transportation Trust Fund. The reason this conversation has to happen today, Mr. Speaker, is that folks are returning to their districts for, for two weeks where they're going to be hearing from folks who are sitting in that traffic, where they're going to be hearing from folks whose contracts to build, build those highways are about to, to expire. They're going to hear from, from their governors and their state legislators who are no longer able to let the contracts for, for needed projects. Why? Because the money is expiring in two months. We're starting to run a trust fund deficit. There's not enough money coming in to meet the current needs. Now, Mr. Speaker, I don't really enjoy talking about the current needs. I didn't, I didn't run for Congress to be in the maintenance uh, business. I, I ran for Congress to be in the transformation business. I'm more than a little embarrassed that, that what we're talking about here is how do we maintain and improve the Eisenhower interstate highway system. Eisenhower was long gone from office before I was even born. We're talking about how to how to maintain this uh, this infrastructure. I'd like to be in the in the driverless cars infrastructure business. I'd like to be in the hypersonic jets uh, infrastructure business. But where we are, because the calendar dictates it, is in the how do we continue to maintain safe highways just two months from now. You can't see these tick marks, Mr. Speaker, but we're talking about in the ballpark of $50 billion a year that goes into this effort. Thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of interstate highways around the, the country, about $50 billion, uh, a, a year. The, the deficits are, are running uh, uh, down uh, ultimately uh, by the end of our 10-year budget uh, window uh, to almost uh, $130 billion in highway uh, deficits. Have to find a way to, to meet those needs. We had a hearing in our committee uh, just the other day, the Transportation Committee, Mr. Speaker, and I want to quote the, the mayor of Salt Lake City. He was there on behalf of the, the uh, National League of Cities. Uh, this is not a notoriously conservative uh, organization. Uh, 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 mayors are, a, are a, a, a practical bunch uh, by nature. They have to respond to the needs of, of, uh, of all of their citizens. They're a relatively liberal bunch by, uh, by nature. Uh, but he says this. He says, I can tell you as someone who spent a career working as a NEPA planner and lawyer. NEPA is, is the Environmental Policy Act. It, that, that's what, may, that's what uh, federally regulates all environmental decisions uh, across the country, particularly as it relates to construction. He says, working as a NEPA planner and lawyer, that what's happened with what I view as an absolutely great environmental law, the National Environmental Policy Act, is truly unfortunate. We've gone from processes that should be a year or a year and a half to processes that are five to seven years in many big transportation projects. 
time is in transportation projects. There's not a member in this chamber who wants to see environmental degradation in this country. There's not a member in this chamber that wants to see the skies less blue or the grass less green. Every member in this chamber cares about children and grandchildren and the next generation. But here we have an advocate for the environmental protection laws that are, that are, that are available to us in this country, and he says something has gone awry. awry. We wrote this, this wonderful law in order to protect our environment, but now, instead of being able to complete needed projects in a year or 18 months, with litigation, special interest groups, these processes get dragged on for five, six, or seven years. And that time means more money out of the Highway Trust Fund in order to complete that project. So what are we going to do, Mr. Speaker, about these coming trust fund deficits? Well, one thing we can do is help to address the policy failures that are delivering less than a dollar's worth of value to my constituents and your constituents for their dollars worth of gas tax. If I could build a project today with that dollar, I could get a dollar's worth of value out of it. If I have to litigate the issue for seven years, the value of that dollar is going to erode. I'm going to have to waste that dollar on litigation costs. We can change the law and we can do so in a bipartisan way that absolutely respects all of our commitments to environmental protection but allows us to complete these needed tasks. Because I'll tell you what doesn't help global warming, Mr. Speaker. And that's folks sitting in Atlanta highways for an hour every day, not moving. If you, can, if you are concerned about the use of fossil fuels in this country, I promise you that having people move slower in Atlanta is not helping. We need those folks to be able to move more quickly uh, to their goal. We will reduce emissions as a result. What else can we do, Mr. Speaker, as a body? What I have here, and I just chose the state of Georgia because it's that uh, area that I know best. These are the Georgia statewide designated freight corridors. Uh, I live uh, uh, right up here just outside of Atlanta, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm right off I-85. That's Interstate 85, Federal Interstate uh, 85. And, and that's designated as a, as a freight corridor. Our, our use of the roads is not just to get to and from the grocery store, of course, not just to get to and from school but for farmers to get their produce from Iowa to our grocery store, for manufacturers to get their products from the computer factory in California to our schools. We have a national interest in these freight carters. One of these uh, freight carters runs out I-16. It runs out to the port of Savannah. The port of Savannah, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if you know, it's the fastest growing container port in the country container port being those, those ports that specialize in, in getting the, those 18-wheeler uh, uh, cargo containers uh, off the ships onto a chassis delivering goods to, to where they need to go. Fastest growing container port in the country. It sits out here at the end of I-16. We have major construction projects to get all the product off those ships out across the southeastern United States. So this, this map of red lines, Mr. Speaker, represents not only interstate highways, but also some major federal roads. I've got uh, US-1 listed here. US-1, Mr. Speaker, is, as uh, you may know, uh, runs uh, about, a, oh golly, we're about two and a half miles from this building. About two and a half miles west from this building, uh, you're going to hit uh, US-1. Well, U.S. 1, run, 1 runs uh, all the way down the eastern coast uh, from, from the great uh, northeast all the way down uh, to Florida. It's a federal transportation corridor. But what's not on this list, Mr. Speaker, for example, is Highway 29, U.S. Highway 29. It runs right past uh, my house in Gwinnett County. It's a U.S. highway. It consumes U.S. transportation dollars. And while once upon a time it was a major corridor for moving nationally important equipment, freight, produce, today it has become a, a side corridor. My question is, if we're limited with our dollars, can we be more discriminating 
in choosing which roads have a national importance. I told you the tale of, of Forsyth County that I represent, Mr. Speaker, billion dollar bond initiative to expand its major highway. Georgia 400 uh, is its major highway. We don't need the federal government to take care of every single square inch of pavement in this country. When we talked about uh, establishing postal roads in 1787, there was kind of the understanding that if this was a major thoroughfare, of course they had not contemplated pavement at all, but if this was going to be a major maintained thoroughfare, we might have a federal interest in it. Not so anymore. I talked about US-1, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, US-1 is right out here, uh, about two and a half miles away, but just between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Mr. Speaker, the federal government with federal tax dollars collected from all across the nation maintains three separate federal roads. We maintain the Baltimore-Washington Parkway, which is a National Park Service road. We represent, we, we uh, uh, take care of uh, US-1, and we take care of Interstate 95. Those roads are never more than five miles from each other, and yet, because tradition dictates it, we're spending national dollars to maintain three relatively duplicative pieces of highway. We've got to have that conversation. Maybe there's a reason unbeknownst to me why it is we can't just maintain one of those roads, why we have to maintain them all. But the federal government doesn't have to do everything for everybody, Mr. Speaker. We just have to make sure that those interstate corridors are being maintained, those primary national designated freight corridors are being maintained, it's okay to leave the rest to communities and states to handle. I want to give you an example. I'm not picking on anybody in particular. These projects go on all across the, the country, Mr. Speaker, but you can see someone's home uh, right here. They've got some holly bushes uh, out in front, a little uh, maple tree uh, here that's been planted on the, uh, on the uh, uh, right-of-way. What you see here are brand-new curbs and sidewalks and about a three-and-a-half-foot bike lane that we spent a million federal dollars to build. Now, I'm glad, assuming this uh, family wants a uh, uh, giant curb and big sidewalk and bike lane in their front yard, I'm glad they were able to get it. I'm glad that we're planting maple trees in the right-of-way uh, there. I, we are not quite mowing the grass in that uh, space, but I hope the community is going to take on that challenge. But this is not a major freight corridor. This is not an interstate highway system. This is a small, small road somewhere in America that a million dollars worth of federal taxpayer dollars are going to beautify a street. Mr. Speaker, that comes from a project, from a program called the Transportation Alternatives Program. Over the last two years, Mr. Speaker, that's been more than a billion dollars. A billion dollars dollars going towards these kinds of projects, almost two billion. Let me tell you what kinds of, of, of big, important federal projects, kind of rising to that constitutional level of, of building post roads for commerce. Well, anything that you build that relates to a sidewalk counts. Anything that you create relating to bicycle infrastructure counts. If you can find some traffic calming techniques, don't know what a traffic, cal traffic calming technique is, but if you can identify one, Mr. Speaker, we can pay for it out of this multi-billion dollar trust fund. The construction of turnouts, overlooks, and viewing areas. Mr. Speaker, you do not want to be behind me when I'm riding through a national park. You do not want to be behind me while I'm going down that beautiful highway in Virginia running all the way down to the great state of Georgia because I am driving slowly, sucking it all in and turning into every turnout along the way and taking pictures. Oh, I love a good drive, particularly in the fall. 
but I promise you I do not need one taxpayer dollar paying for one turnout on one highway so that I can get a better picture. Georgia Transportation and Tourism Board, Mr. Speaker, if we need a turnout in the great state of Georgia, if, if it's going to bring more tourist traffic to our area, if it's going to allow us to put in a, a small restaurant where folks can stop and eat and enjoy our beautiful scenery, we will build that because tourists will demand it and it will grow our economy. In a time where trust fund dollars have been eroded by inflation, in a time where we know we don't have enough money coming in, to maintain our current interstate highway system in a time that we're talking about raising taxes on the American consumer in order to provide those resources, isn't it also time to end the non-federal priority spending that is currently embedded in the federal gas tax, like turnouts? Mr. Speaker, one of the projects that was built with that multi-billion dollar trust fund was down in the great state of Georgia. It's called the Silver Comet Trail. And the truth is that we only have one really good long bike trail in the entire metropolitan Atlanta area. It is the Silver Comet Trail, and it's fabulous. It is absolutely fabulous. You go out there on any beautiful day, you're going to have joggers, you're going to have walkers, you're going to have bike riders. Folks are going to be pushing strollers. It is a festival of humanity there on that bike trail. Wonderful, wonderful way to spend your day. We spent 3.7 million federal dollars so that my neighbors and I could have a fabulous biking and walking trail in our backyard. Wasn't my idea. I wasn't in Congress at the time. We've got to ask ourselves, is it worth raising taxes on the American driver, on American industry that uses our roads so that more local communities can build more fabulous bike trails in their own backyard? I don't ask my colleagues, Mr. Speaker, whether bike trails are valuable or not. I believe them to be so. I ask my colleagues whether or not metropolitan Atlanta, the most prosperous uh, major metropolitan city in the entire southeastern United States, can afford to build its own bike trails, or whether or not we need to call on the rest of the nation to aid us in that effort. Mr. Speaker, I've got another project here. It was only $60,000. Isn't that sad? When we get into this place, we start talking about projects that are only thousands and thousands of dollars. Because when you're managing a $3.8 trillion budget, Mr. Speaker, it's hard to keep track of the thousands. That's why we don't want a big federal budget. We don't want to be in the business of wasting money. $60,000 went to a project called Petaflag. Now, this is in a small downtown area out west. And there's a crosswalk going across the street, and folks are concerned about pedestrian safety. There are pedestrian tragedies every year in this country, every year in my community. Certainly want to do everything we can to stop them. The $60,000 Petaflag program goes to each end of a crosswalk, and it puts yellow flags in big buckets on each end of the crosswalk, Mr. Speaker, so that when you're prepared to walk across the street, you can grab one of these flags and you can wave it as you cross the street, the street is two lanes, but you can wave it as you cross those two lanes to make sure that drivers coming down that low speed limit thoroughfare don't run into you. Well, I think that's fabulous. I like a good parade, Mr. Speaker. I love waving flags. But my question to you is, with all the challenges facing this chamber, we've got Social Security that's going bankrupt, we've got Medicare that's going bankrupt, we live in a dangerous world with, with ISIS and, and Russia, Iran. Is the priority for the tax dollars that we have been entrusted with, really that we have confiscated from the American people, is the priority to spend 60000 of those tax dollars to have buckets of flags on both sides of a two-lane street so that pedestrians can wave them as they cross? 
If folks love parades as much as I do, Mr. Speaker, that local community can put those flags in place. A federal grant program is not necessary. Got an article here, Mr. Speaker, from just last month. It's talking about this, uh, uh, this, this program that uh, allows these grant dollars to go out for all of these non-high-priority federal purposes. They cite a $112,000 grant for a white squirrel sanctuary. For a white squirrel sanctuary. Mr. Speaker, I have nothing against white squirrels. I will slow down when I am driving as the gray squirrels in my community cross the street. But I have no interest in confiscating federal tax dollars that were intended to maintain a critically important national highway infrastructure and having a local community who views that as free money spend it to create a white squirrel sanctuary. Mr. Speaker, these dollars are going to build boardwalks in our beach communities. They're going to resurface bike trails. They're even going to buy driving simulators at car museums, because that kind of is peripherally related to transportation. They, uh, in my day, uh, Mr. Speaker, it was just that Atari 2600 that you could do the night driving uh, program. Today, we can spend 198000 federal gas tax dollars to buy driving simulators to go into museums so that when folks come by they can experience after they've driven on the ratty roads that were unmaintained to get to the museum they can have a wonderful driving experience inside the federally taxpayer paid simulator mr speaker i don't fault museums for wanting simulators I don't fault communities for wanting bike trails i don't fault communities for wanting flag waving crosswalks I fault this Congress for facing a fiscal challenge with how do we complete our constitutional responsibility to maintain our roads and to even have the discussion of raising tax dollars before we've completed making the current accounts more effective, more efficient, and more accountable. Mr. Speaker, I do not value members who simply talk about everything that's wrong and make no recommendations about how to fix it. We need to narrow the number of roads that qualify for federal support. We need to prioritize what are those roads that fall into that constitutional responsibility and which ones obviously do not. Prioritize that spending take care of only those mission critical roads leave the rest to local communities number two deal with our environmental regulations that are slowing needed construction not abolish our environmental regulations not ignore our environmental stewardship responsibilities but recognize that advocates for the environment advocates for the NEPA act as the mayor of Salt Lake City suggested even those advocates realize we have gone far afield from what was intended years of expense and delay for projects that we ought to be able to complete in a year and 18 months let's streamline that that's two and number three take all these feel-good projects that every one of us has uh, heard of in our district all the feel-good projects, those projects that don't have anything to do with major national thoroughfares, those projects that don't have anything to do with our constitutional responsibility to maintain our interstate corridors and abolish those all together. Mr. Speaker, they did a poll the other day amongst young people in this country Young people, of course, when you get your first uh, job at 16, you, you get that paycheck, you thought you were making uh, uh, $8 an hour. Turns out after the government uh, gets its share, you're only making about $5 an hour. Uh, we find out we get lots of new voters uh, when they get their first uh, paycheck because folks realize the, uh, the importance of having your voice uh, heard. The largest tax 
that 80 percent of American families pay, Mr. Speaker, is that payroll tax that's taken out of that paycheck before you even see it, that FICA line in your paycheck. 80 percent of American families pay. It goes to fund Social Security and Medicare. And yet, in a recent poll among young people, more American young people believe they would see a UFO in their lifetime than believe they would see a Social Security check in their lifetime. Mr. Speaker, you cannot break promises to taxpayers in that way. We have serious responsibilities in this chamber. They do not include feel-good projects in local communities. They do not include squirrel sanctuaries and flag-waving projects and boardwalk resufferings resurfacings. What they include is maintaining those mission-critical interstate corridors. As we gather together to reauthorize the surface transportation bill, as we gather together to sort out the diminishing value of the highway trust fund, let us come together to restore some of that faith with the American taxpayer that we will be accountable, that we will be efficient, and that we will be effective in the use of every one of their taxpayer dollars. We cannot ask them for more until we have proven to them that we have used responsibly what they sent to us yesterday.